You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 82. Welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, after uh, last weekend's cheese making session, I ended up making a Montasio or an Italian Alpine style cheese. Um, I often get uh, flamed by passionate Italians about my labelling of cheese names. Um, all you have to do is go to my par- recent Parmesan cheese video to get a sample of uh, of uh, food foodieism gone crazy. Anyway, um, so I named it Montasio Alpine style cheese, and uh, it's going to be released um, sometime in the next few days. So that's fantastic. Now. The great thing about making that Alpine-style cheese was the process was, kind of took me back to grassroots. It was very simple. It used a thermophilic culture. You basically cut the curds with a balloon whisk to make them very small and stirred up to, from a lower temperature up to a higher one, and then stirred for another 30-odd minutes. And then basically that was it. All you did was press the cheese, brine the cheese, and Bob's your uncle, mature it for a whole year. Now, that does sound a little bit daunting that whole year, but uh, just uh, take it from me, it's pretty easy to mature uh, those long-aged alpine cheeses, Um, especially ones that don't have anything like um, Propionic Shimani in them or anything like that because they don't need to have any really special care except for turn them every single week. That's all, all you have to do to them. There's not too much to it. So that's pretty cool. Okay, um, I have some very interesting news this week, so let's get on with that. So this news has been all over the cheese-making forums and uh, Facebook and everywhere else I can see. Anyway, I decided to get... Uh, to the truth of it all, and I got a link from a lovely subscriber. Um, let me see who it was. Nope, I can't find it now. <laughs> Not too sure, can't remember who it was. But anyway, somebody sent me through a link to Science Daily, which is all about research news. Now, you may think that's a pretty dry subject when it comes to um talking about cheese making, but this is very interesting. So the title of the news article is World's Oldest Cheese Found in Egyptian Tomb. Okay, the summary is aging usually improves... I'll start again. Aging usually improves the flavour of cheese, but that's not why some very old cheese discovered in an Egyptian tomb is drawing attention. Instead, it's thought to be the most ancient solid cheese ever found. So um, now there is a there was a study uh, and it was published in the journal Analytical Chemistry. So I'll read the it's a very brief story. This is not sensationalised or anything like that, like the mainstream press did. This is the scientific facts. Okay, so a tomb of uh, Tar Tarmes. Mayor of Memphis in Egypt during the 13th century BC was initially unearthed in 1885. After being lost under drifting sands, it was rediscovered in 2010 and archaeologists found broken jars at the site a few years later. One jar contained a solid whitish mass as well as canvas fabric that may have covered the jar or been used to preserve its contents. Enrico Greco and colleagues wanted to analyse the whitest subject to determine its identity. After discovering the sample, the researchers purified its protein constituents and analysed them with liquid chromography and mass spectrometry. 
My goodness. The peptides detected by these techniques show that the sample was a dairy product made from cow's milk and sheep or goat's milk. The characteristics of the fabric, the canvas fabric, which indicated it was suitable for containing a solid rather than a liquid, and the absence of other specific markers support the conclusion that the dairy product was a solid cheese. Other peptides in the food suggest it also contained uh, what it was. I'll start that again. Other peptides in the food sample suggested it was contaminated with Brucella melatensis. Melatensis. I'll get that right. Brucella melitensis, a bacterium that causes bruce, brucellosis. This potentially deadly disease spreads from animals to people, typically from eating unpasteurized dairy products. If the team's preliminary analysis is confirmed, the sample would represent the earliest reported biomecular evidence of the disease. Well, there you go. Fantastic. And the journal reference is um, Enrico Greco et al. Um, pro proteomic, uh, protomic, that's better, protomic analysis on a Egyptian, ancient Egyptian cheese and biomecular evidence of brucellosis. So there you go. So that's the journal reference, not sensationalized or anything like that. So basically uh, that bacterium, that, that uh, potentially deadly bacterium, um, is actually killed during pasteurisation. So I suppose that's uh, one tick to pasteurisation, one cross against uh, raw milk, uh, certainly back in the old days. That's why a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, dairies that produce raw milk cheese under strict supervision, and they test their milk to make sure that there are no uh, bad bacterias um, in their milk. Anyway, great little story. I thought that was quite interesting, and especially the uh, link to the uh, proper scientific report on the world's oldest cheese. Anyway, I'll pop that into the show notes so you can read it further if you want to, or um, check out some of the other cheesy stuff on Science Daily. So let's get into some uh, listener questions. Okay, the first question is from John, so let's play that. Hey, Gavin, this is uh, John from Vicksburg, Michigan. I uh, love your stuff. To, I've been a fan for well over a year, and to date I've made at least 20 of your recipes and uh, good stuff, but I have an off-the-wall question. And uh, recently we were at a country fair, took the kids and uh, the younglings, the grandkids. And it struck me when we went into the this one barn with all these pigs, has anybody ever made a pig milk cheese? Um, I don't know. It's a little off the wall, but thanks for your input. Take care. God bless you. Well, thank you very much, John. In fact, there is, there's a guy, uh, a guy, there's always a guy. Uh, there's a, um, in the Dutch town of Bathman, uh, a pig farmer called Eric Stegink um, is trying his hand at making cheese from milking his sows. Um, so there's an article, I'll, I will put a link to that in the show notes. Now, I'll just, uh, uh, it says that some time in your life, uh, you probably wonder about the taste of sow's milk. Yes, sow's, not cow's. Uh, that's not weird at all. We're merely used to consuming cow's milk, but there's also plenty of people who swear by camel's milk, ass milk, and fermented horse milk, uh, which makes you feel tipsy. Whatever's clever. In the Netherlands, they happen to have plenty of pigs. Apparently, they've got approximately 12 million. Pig farmer Eric Stegink of Piggy's Palace, is a progressive farmer in Bathman. He's no stranger to the news, having installed an old slide on his farm to ensure that his pigs would have fun jumping in the mud and once organised a fa fashion show amid the swine. 
Nowadays, he's crafting a young cheese made of pig's milk in collaboration with cheese stores Colas Inthoff. Uh, the world of pig's milk is quite small. Apparently, there's a modest farmer in Tuscany who makes porcino. <laughs> that's funny. And an American chef who's obsessed with pig's milk, but that's pretty much it. Not wanting to miss an opportunity, um, the reporter called up Eric. Anyway, so I'll put the... Uh, the, the it's one of my dogs in the background. <laughs> I'll put the uh, article from um, Eric and his pig's milk cheese into the show notes. So there you go, John. Thanks for the question. Yes, there is somebody who's uh, crazy enough to uh, milk a sow. You know, they've got like 10 teats. So um, uh, quite amazing that they would be able to milk the sow. So... Okay, the next um, question is from Alicia. So we'll just have a listen to that, shall we? Hey, Gavin. The question is if it is possible to make a cheese completely at room temperature or at less culture and solidify the meal at room temperature. Even if it means letting it sit for an extra tour. Tang Yudang. Well, that sounded very robotic. But anyway, from the gist of that, I figured that uh, it meant, are there any cheeses you can mature at room temperature? Now, that's all very subjective, of course. Um, room temperature it can be many things to many people. So the standard temperature for room temperature is usually quoted at 21 degrees Celsius. Um, not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but 21 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, comfortable. It's comfortable for the human body. Now, cheeses that can mature at that temperature, um, and there are a few. So uh, one that I know of and I've done myself is a simple feta. So that's traditional feta used with 70% sheep's milk and 30% um, uh, goat's milk. And that was matured at uh, room temperature for five days and then you put it in the fridge for storage, in the normal fridge. And that's all there is to that. And you just the longer you store it, the better it tastes. So feta is a good example. Um, another good example is something like cream cheese where you, um, you basically add a few drops of rennet to a pot of milk and... Then you let that sit on the side for about 20, uh, 18 to 24 hours and then it turns into a solid. Uh, and then you strain the curds off through a cheesecloth, a, uh, a butter muslin. And then you let that drain for about 12 to 18 hours, all at room temperature. And then the cheese is ready to eat. Now, soft cheeses obviously don't take that long to mature. So hopefully that answers your question, Alicia. Um, so... And thank you for sending that in, even though it sounded a bit robotic. It sounded uh, very computerish. Um, anyway, the next question is from Rod. This is Rod in the UK. Gavin, my buddy, I just wanted to ask what cheese is it that is mentioned in various places in the Old Testament. It is usually in the context of feeding it to soldiers as nutritious food. Also, in the book of Isaiah, there is a foretelling of the Messiah, which says that, when the Messiah is matured to know right from wrong, that he would choose right. And the allegory is that he will choose curd and honey. So in your opinion, knowing what cheeses they ate in the Middle East, what does curd mean in that context? Thank you so much, cheese man. You are a legend. <laughs> That's a very cool one. I don't know how that was done, but it's uh, very interesting. Anyway, so going back to ancient cheeses again, we've already talked in, during this episode about ancient Egyptian cheese, so let's think about where it all started. Now, I was reading a book called Cheese and Culture, uh, and it's not culture as in starter culture, but I think it's a play on words. A uh, great little book, and it does go into the early history of cheese making. Now, they do believe that cheese making was discovered probably by the Babylonians um, during those early times. 
uh, in the Fertile Crescent area of the Middle East. So between the river Euphrates and Tigris, or Tigris, however you want to pronounce it. Um, so what they essentially did was leave raw milk until it uh, turned into a curd, acidified by itself, so it was a lactic set cheese, and then you had curds and whey, and you could strain that off through a cloth. Um, and what they did was basically use uh, that sort of cheese, and it was usually from goats, not necessarily cows, um, in the early days anyway, um, because goats were domesticated before cows, and they used it for offerings to the gods, and mainly to the god Ishtar. Um, so usually, so I'm thinking what happened after all the people left and they, they put their offering, their cheese offering, uh, to the gods, um, the, uh, the uh, priests in the temple um, scoffed down all the cheese. So that's a very basic cheese. And you have a look at the cheeses that exist today from the Middle East. There's a very good cheese called Labna, which is a yogurt cheese. So basically they set the cheese into a yogurt, which is very much the same as just leaving raw milk to turn solid, uh, and they simply strain it. So uh, very simple to make, and then you you know strain it off and you can mix some salt into it and eat it. So those sort of cheeses are, the, are around today. Um, very similar to cheeses found um, uh, down into Jerusalem. So in the Bible, as I mentioned, curds and honey, very similar. It's just going to be a soft cheese that's been lactic uh, set. So the acidification of the milk has set the curds in whey and uh, it'll be a yogurt sort of cheese. So thank you, Rod, for your uh, robotic uh, question. Um, but it sounded pretty cool. So... <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, hopefully got something out of that one. All right, the last question is from Kristen. Hi, Gavin. I have a milk goat and have been making lots of different types of cheeses with my goat's milk. Uh, this summer I started making cheddar and gouda thanks to your great YouTube videos. I really enjoy them. I appreciate how much time you spend and how helpful they are. I have a question that I haven't been able to find an answer to. If I'm sealing my cheese in wax or a vacuum sealed in plastic and then I store it to age it, how come the humidity in my cheese cave uh, can affect it? I have been storing my cheese in a root cellar which maintains the perfect temperature, but it's not um, as moist as it should be. The humidity is staying down around 50% and I'm trying various tricks to raise it, but I don't understand why the humidity matters if it's sealed, the cheese is sealed against the air. And I'd appreciate it if you could address this. Thanks so much. No problems at all, Kristen, and here's a salute to your goats. <laughs> right. Um, to answer your question, the humidity does not matter. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, for waxed and for vacuum-packed cheeses, uh, humidity doesn't matter uh, one iota. Um, having said that, a little bit, if, um, if there's no humidity and it's really, really dry, then waxed, waxed cheeses tend to split the wax. Um, as they age. It does happen sometimes. But normally, if you've got a relative humidity of 50% and above, no issues. You don't have to worry about it. It doesn't affect the cheese at all. It's all sealed in, um, so the cheese is going to age with the moisture that it's got trapped in the container it's in or the vessel that it's in. So don't worry about it too much. But I am a bit jealous that you've actually got a, um, a root cellar there that has the perfect temperature for cheese making. I wish I had something like that instead of having to run a cheese fridge 24-7. And even though it's very economical on electricity, it would be pretty cool if I had a root cellar and I could put all my cheeses and line them all up on pine shelving and all that sort of stuff. That would be very cool indeed. Anyway, thank you so much for sending in that question, Christian. Kristen.
Okay, now we've got the questions out of the way. I've got one humble request, and that's to shoot through some uh, some reviews uh, on iTunes. Now, I have had some recent reviews on iTunes, so I'll just bring those up and I'll read some out to you. I'm very pleased, very happy that people are happy with, um, with the show. So um, I've got one here from... Um, uh, what's this, July 25th, 2018. So this is from Jim Jiminy Jim from Canada. Uh, he says, so great, five stars. Absolutely fantastic. My favourite cheese-making resource out there. Uh, listened from episode one, and by the time you're all done, you've learned as much or more than you might at a professional cheese-making intensive. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I dare say that's probably your name, um, for that wonderful review. There's another one. Uh, it says, Outstanding Info on Cheese Making, five stars. This is uh, from August 4th, 2018, from Sa Sable Wolf in the United States. It says, If you are interested in anything to do with cheese, this podcast is for you. Host Gavin Weber takes you through an aspect of cheese making, interviews with other people who are doing it, a current cheese-related news segment and answers questions from listeners having submitted in each episode. I've been quite amazed by his depth of knowledge and he's provided answers to several problems I've encountered as well. Top rate. It's a pity I can't read properly. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, Sable Wolf. I appreciate that review. And one final review we've got. It's titled Great Resource, Five Stars. Um, this was posted on August 28th, 2018 by Olive Stones from the United States. I have been learning to make cheese for the past year. Gavin's podcast and video series have been a tremendous resource for me. His love for the cheese making craft is evident in the amount of research he will perform in order to answer a list listener's question, cheese question. All th thumbs up for the amount of time and energy he puts into his quality podcast. He cracks me up with his attempts at pronunciation. <laughs> uh, that is so true. Um, I do have issues or troubles, problems more likely, on pronouncing people's names and all those strange, anything's not English. In fact, I have trouble with English as well. Anyway, thank you so much, Olive Stones, for that lovely podcast review. Now, you can leave a podcast review over at iTunes or within the um, within the show notes of each of the podcast episodes. Pop over to littlegreencheese.com and you'll see the show notes for each show episode and you can leave a comment in the bottom and I can read those out as well. But uh, fantastic. Thank you for those three wonderful people who left me iTunes reviews over at iTunes for my podcast. All you have to do is go to the podcast section of iTunes um, and leave a, a, a rating and a review. I don't mind. Um, I'm happy to take constructive criticism anytime. All righty. You can find my cheese making ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. There's also a link at littlegreencheese.com. You can buy kits, supplies, and equipment over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au and there's a big vast cheese making section for anybody who wants to make cheese you can also pick up my ebook at any good ebook retailer amazon and iBookstore. well thanks for listening once again don't forget you can pick up uh, you can check out, sorry, all of my cheese making videos over on my YouTube channel. Just simply type in cheeseman.tv and that'll whisk you away to my channel. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next exciting episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. Bye. Well, thanks again, YouTubers, uh, for watching the episode of 
Little Green Cheese podcast. I stumbled a few times there for the, some of the words, but uh, a little bit of creative editing will fix all that up, of course. So uh, thanks for watching a audio podcast. It's very strange, but I think a lot of people do like it. So I'm certainly going to keep it up. Anyway, thanks for watching Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time.